Okay, good afternoon, good evening, everyone, and welcome to a special Giving Day edition of SETI Live um, featuring the Hat Creek Radio Observatory. My name is Simon Steele. Um, I am uh, calling in from uh, the South Bay near the SETI headquarters in Mountain View, California, and I'm speaking today with, with uh, my colleagues up in Northern California, uh, Dr. Alex Pollack and Dr. Wael Farah. Hello. Nice to see you again. Hey, Simon. Nice to be uh, here. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the Hat Creek Radio Observatory that, that I had the privilege of visiting last week. It was wonderful for the first time. I uh, got a tour, got to see the, the, the dishes up front, and we got to do a, a little bit of an observing run as well. Might take, say a little bit about that later on. But I think um, some of the uh, listeners will be familiar with um, the observatory and some may not be. So I wondered if we could just say a little bit about uh, the Hat Creek Radio Observatory and the Allen Telescope Array, and maybe you know the the distinction between one and the other as as we use both terms. So, um, uh, well, do you want to say a little bit about that? Um, sure. Yeah. So the Hat Creek Radio Observatory is um, basically the the entire um, the entire land where um, the multiple instruments can coexist um, at the um, uh, on an on an observatory. So the an observatory can host multiple instruments. Um, as well as um, the maintenance um, staff housing, as well as um, any other workshops um, or workplaces where um, um, maintenance staff need to need to work. Um, the Allen Telescope Array, on the other hand, is one instrument that um, is hosted on the on the Hat Creek Radio Observatory. And um, I might actually tell Alex, um, pass it to Alex to. Um, yeah, it yeah, was, yeah. was a good, good kind of segue. Um, yeah, so we are basically the observatory and the instrument is located in the Lassen National Forest, um, close to Redding, um, so between Mount Lassen and Mount Shasta. And so what you see here is a picture of um, a few of the Allen Telescope array antennas and each of those antennas is around six meters in diameter or around uh, 20 foot in diameter. And so we have 42 of those antennas up at the observatory. And out of those 42, we have 24 operational antennas at the moment. And we are kind of trying to kind of throughout the year, get the number um, closer to the initial 42. Um, so we have all of them operational. And so we're currently using that one, um, those 20 antennas or 20 of the 24 antennas for um, SETI observing pretty much every day. Yeah, it's really good that the 24 running out of uh, 42, and this this is really a, a, a dramatic, uh, you know, increase in development over the last year or so, um, which is fabulous. And uh, we'll say more a little bit about the upgrades um, that are that are ongoing uh, as we talk. But for everybody uh, tuning in, please do let us know uh, where you're uh, uh, tuning in from, um, and also if you have any questions for Alex and Weil uh, towards the end, we'll we'll try and get to as many of the questions as possible. Just Stick them into the, the comments and the chat on, on Facebook and YouTube, and um, we will uh, get those answered in a little while. Um, so this is this is the a radio telescope facility that is dedicated to SETI searches, isn't it? And it, it is now doing its thing. Um, when we were there, you were in the middle of, of doing a survey of, of nearby stars, SETI search. Can you say a little bit more about that, um, that observing program? I guess uh, I can yeah, give that to Wael. So yeah, he's actually okay. another person <laughs> yeah. who yeah, uses the instrument <laughs> and points the antennas. Uh, sure, sure. Yeah, sure. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks, Alex. Um, so we are, we're currently using a, um, um, a, a combined version of the, of the, of the telescopes. We basically, we combine the telescopes in such a way that we can um, maximize our sensitivity at a particular small patch of the sky. And um, if you include, or if you're, you know, if you're clever enough to know where you're searching, say you're looking at a at a nearby star, you can maximize the the sensitivity of your instrument to that particular star. Um, so what we're currently doing is we selected um, around 300 or 250 nearby stars that host um, um, that host exoplanets, and we um, we're trying to basically do a SETI search. Um, by scanning over frequency, of course, changing sources uh, throughout the throughout the day or throughout the night, scanning through frequencies, 
and then searching um, that data for um, narrowband signals that are the footprint of a extraterrestrial um, intelligent um, life form. Okay. Say more about the uh, narrowband signal. So you're searching lots of different frequencies, like tuning through the dial of a radio to pick up that your favorite radio station, um, and uh, you're you're doing that through many 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 frequencies at one go, aren't you? Um, so. What sort of uh, frequency range are you operating in, and and what are you hoping okay. to see? You know, of all this all this data, and we'll talk more about the data downloads in a second. <laughs> what sort of thing it would would make you excited? So 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 one of the things there, which is very I think unique to the survey with the ATA, is the wide frequency range which we can cover. So for that survey, we chose we go from two and a half gigahertz to ten gigahertz. We, um, a lot of the surveys have been done in the past below two and a half gigahertz, but there haven't been any or many survey, surveys kind of above two and a half gigahertz and especially not to 10 gigahertz. So that's kind of a range where kind of not many people have looked at for SETI signals. And so at the moment, so the plan is to take those 300 objects and observe them five times over that entire frequency range. And that will take about half a year to kind of go on all of those objects, observe them, and then kind of repeat four more times um, to see if something changes over time as well. So we get information not over frequency, we also get information over time, has something changed from the last time we looked at an object or not. Right. That's, that's interesting because of course you've got to go back, you know, you, you hope you don't miss that, that signal and you hope mm -hmm. that if, if a, uh, um, an entity is broadcasting for whatever reason that it's not just a you know a, a, a thirty second burst um, mm -hmm. that there is a chance that you you will be there on target. Um, well, what would a signal look like, or what what do we think? Uh, who knows what 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 aliens will be transmitting? But what would we like to see? Uh, what what would the characteristics be? That's uh, yeah, that's an excellent question, um, Simon. And I, I wish I really knew the answer because then, <laughs> then, then we I'm, know where to look and we know uh, what to see. <laughs> exactly. Um, so um, what what we're hoping to see here is a is a is a narrow band. And when I talk about narrow band, something on the order of a few hertz, um, or even less than that, um, signal that is just being um, transmitted a really bright. Um, but also it has to be um, drifting in frequency. And the reason, reason behind that is um, say my left hand, I'm not sure if you're seeing the left hand on the other side, but say, say this hand is, is earth and the transmitter is somewhere in the middle of, the, you know, of our galaxy or somewhere in our galaxy, there ought to always be a um, relative velocity between the earth and the transmitter or the receiver and the transmitter. And so um, this will cause the, the signal that's being um, propagated to be Doppler shifted or shifted upwards in frequency or lower in frequency. It's the same effect when um, you hear a, an ambulance either coming towards you or coming or, or heading um, away from you. You hear the pitch or the frequency of the, of the ambulance going down or up. So we're kind of searching for the same thing, but in light waves. And so um, what, what we do is we search over, you know, the entire frequency band, the entire sources, but also over different um, drift rates as, um, as, as, we record, as we record data. Okay. Yeah, everything is moving in space, isn't it? So even if you're getting a, a monochromatic or a single si uh, uh, frequency signal going out, it's coming off of a planet that's rotating, that's going around its star, uh, and it's beamed towards us as a planet that's moving at 30 kilometers a second in its orbit around the sun, Everything, everything's moving. And that needs to be taken into account. And that would be, that's a, a sign of a good signal if you see that shift. Um, we got people tuning in from everywhere. Let me just uh, give uh, a, a few examples. Louisiana, Canada, Ohio, Sweden, Norway, the Netherlands, New York City, Connecticut, Mississippi, Montana, um, Alaska, Miami, Buenos Aires, uh, Birmingham in the UK. Um, so wonderful. And we have um, uh, some stars being sent. Uh, Paula, thank you for sending stars. And we have a few questions coming in. So that's wonderful. Um, Going back now to uh, the actual, the hardware, um, I, w I was uh, up visiting the ATA and um, I, uh, when I find this picture, here we go, I uh, got a, a nice picture of Alex in his workshop. Um, 
Alex, would you like to say a little bit about what are you doing with this uh, death ray um, <laughs> uh, sitting on a, on a table? Uh, because yeah. this is part of the upgrade. What's going on here? Try, trying to take over the world. That's yes. basically <laughs> that's it. Yeah. Um, so what do you see in there? That is um, our clean room setup. And the device I'm working at is one of those receivers, one of those feeds. So each of the antenna, which is retrofitted and which is operational, has one of those receivers in it. And the spiky looking thing, that pyramid, which is here um, copper looking, or it's a copper pyramid. So that's the one which actually receives the, the signals um, out of the air or um, which are then focused by the antenna and then converts those signals into signals on a, on a cable, which we then can amplify and even amplify it even more and then digitize it later so we can process it. And so on that particular um, receiver, the cooling mechanism, which you can see below the pyramid was broken and we had to replace it exactly where the mouse is, yeah. So we had to replace that one and basically test that everything works before we put the, um, the receiver part in it again and put it onto the antenna. And that is where I'm kind of working on. And that was one of the very tiny wires broke and I had to resolder it. And you can imagine they're the size of a wire, uh, of a hair or so a bit thicker. They're very finicky to solder. Um, so that's a nice picture. So that's basically the, um, the receiver then after it's put all back together with the, um, the retrofitted pyramid. So that one is gold plated. You can see the difference in color. And that one is located in the antenna now pointing at a secondary mirror. And that's kind of um, how pretty much all of the antennas, um, the 24 antennas, which we have, they look all inside like that. There is um, one of those receivers. And um, with 20 antennas, they're all up and running, but keeping them up and running, it's a lot of work to make sure that kind of for every survey. So if we start every observation, we want to have at least 20 antennas of them in perfect condition um, throughout the night, because we usually run in 12 hour chunks where we do our observations. Right. And so you have, you have 20 antennae, uh, they're receiving a, a many, many different um, wavelengths, uh, they're scanning the skies of 300 uh, <laughs> exoplanets in the sky. This is, this is a lot of data coming down, isn't it? And um, say a little bit about the journey of, of the data from, from the, you know, the, the antenna um, into, you know, or, or onto your monitor where you can actually look for one of these, these drifting mm -hmm. signals. Because that, of course, is, is, is the subject. It's not just picking up the signal it's actually getting all of that data into a form that can be used. And that, that's, that's tough. Yeah, I, I, can, I can start off so with the front end and then I can hand over to Weil because it's kind of, it's a long chain and it kind of changes from analog into the digital over network. And that's where kind of Weil spends all of his kind of work on making sure that we can actually um, store and kind of process all of that information. So you saw kind of the, the antenna, which you can see here basically there as well. And you saw the receiver. And from there, the analog signal goes um, into our signal processing room, which is located where me and Weil are sitting right now, um, over an analog fiber. So we take the entire kind of signals which we receive and transport them into the signal processing room. And there we have a lot of kind of um, analog equipment in there, which allows us to select certain frequencies. So it's the same as on your radio at home or on the older radios where you had a knob to change the frequencies. So we can also do that, the same thing and say like, okay, we want to observe at a particular frequency and you can tune our system to observe at that frequency. That's also then when we observe throughout the night, we can observe the entire two and a half from 2.5 gigahertz to 10 gigahertz in one go, we have to do that in several steps because the bandwidth is just too much to process. So that allows us to tune it. And then we basically, the last step which we do is we have to set the power levels correctly. That's the same thing as well. If you imagine you want to record something over with the microphone, if the power level is too weak or if um, the signal which comes in before you digitize it is too weak, you don't hear anything. It's the same if we would whisper now or we would be too far away from the microphone. And the other um, negative thing would be if it's too loud. So if the signal is so strong that we kind of get out of the dynamic range, then it distorts and it doesn't sound right anymore. And so there's the same thing there that um, basically the signal which we would receive would be distorted. 
And at that point, if all of that is set perfectly and we have all of the signal in there, the power level looks perfect, then we digitize it. And then um, we use something called um, RF SOCs, which are kind of radio frequency system on a chip. So it's um, what is kind of in the newest kind of hardware, like cell phone towers and everything. So they use the same equipment and we digitize it. And then we take the signal and stream it over network into kind of our process nodes. And there is where basically the bottleneck starts. Um, so over the network of the digitizers, we have two 100 gigabit ethernet ports to stream out the raw data comparable kind of a home ethernet port is one gigabit. And so we stream out per digitizers with 200 gigabits. Okay. And we have currently five digitizers and we will upgrade that to 21 digitizers at one go. And then you have to basically stream out all of the data and you have to capture it somehow and process it somehow. And that is a way I think it's a good way of handing over to Wael because <laughs> he's then he's on the other end and he's trying to capture all of that data and is kind of yeah, processing or needs to process that. <laughs> right. Um, and I, I, on a side note, I, I really love how we can um, um, compare light waves, at least radio light waves to sound. It makes things so much easier to explain. Um, so I, I really appreciate that on a, just on a side note. Um, so yeah, so um, the magic happens before the digitizers, at least to me. Um, so Alex knows all of that. Um, once they once they leave the digitizer and we have a digitized signal, so we have now rather than an analog signal, we have a we have a digital signal at hand. Um, the data gets streamed out of the digitizers. Um, we pack the data in such a way that we know how to unpack them. On the other hand, um, or on the other side. Um, and we do some small fancy um, math also on the digitizers um, just because we have the power to do it there. We pack the data and then we send them through the network into the, into the network switches and out into um, um, servers. So those servers are really powerful servers that can acquire data at a rate that is incredibly large. Um, so Alex mentioned the 200 gigabit um, output out of the out of the digitizers, multiply that by five, that's around a thousand gigabit per second. Um, you know, divide by eight to, to go to gigabytes per second, that's roughly around 110-ish gigabytes per second. Um, that's, you know, that's like maybe 30 or 40 high speed or high, um, high, high definition um, 4K movie every second. And that's how, um, that's how much the, the cluster, the computer cluster that we have um, sees. And so once once the data gets out of the um, out of the network switch, they go into the they go into at the moment we have eight of those we have eight machines or eight computers um, that take in the data they unpack them they know what their frequency and time um, um, pretty much place in in you know in, in time and, and space so like everything sort of gets laid down into um, um, volatile memory onto RAM and then after that we um, this, this is where the searching and the, 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 the processing starts. Um, at that point, we have to record the data from all of the antennas. If depending on what we are trying to do with the instrument, the most simple thing is to sum all the antennas together and that's called a beam forming operation. So we have to delay all the antennas with respect to each other in such a way that um, everything sort of adds up coherently. And then we sum everything together to form a single beam on the sky or to, to basically transform our bunch of small telescopes into one big giant telescope. Once that happens, we have to um, um, take, take the data back into the frequency domain and because we're searching for a really narrow signal. We have to pretty much channelize or just pass the data through this um, highly efficient spectrometer. Um, once we have the data in, in you know, post that spectrometer, we have to then search it for a high, for a narrow band signal. And this is where the, the searching happens. After that, we save all the data to disk. There's a bunch of algorithms that go and say, okay, have we detected something interesting here? Yes, let's save this information. Have we not? No. And this, is, this happens for pretty much 99% of the time. Um, we only keep the 1% or the 5% here. I'm just quoting numbers. Um, and then we produce images. And then at the end of the day or the beginning of the day, um, someone would go through the images, look through what has been detected. If there's anything kind of interesting, we, we flag it 
And um, yeah, this is this is when you know things um, pop up on my screen here. You know, this is this is the the final sort of um, resting point of of this entire chain. Okay, and that you know, if this was baking a cake, that would that's when it comes out the oven, and you know, it it looks good, or you hope it looks good, and there could be some interesting interesting layers in it. I hope I look that's, at a, cake, that's, a dread, that's a dreadful analogy. I'm going to stop talking. <laughs> um, but no, and that, uh, this is, of course, why we're here. This is this is Giving Day, um, and you know, listening to the process uh, of, of receiving the signal and getting it to the screen where you can actually uh, take a look to see where there might be a techno signature. Uh, that's a lot of data, and um, it's getting more and more all the time. And so the system needs to be upgraded for it to actually function in a in a way that you know you stand a chance of actually detecting something. Um, and that's why uh, during this giving day, we're 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 trying to fundraise eight thousand dollars for for the array for the uh, Allen Telescope array to upgrade the network so that um, this process can can continue to happen. You know efficiently and much more efficiently as more dishes come online and as alex said if we can get the 42 up and running then this is an incredibly powerful uh device to search for for aliens basically um and so uh eight thousand dollars is the goal um we also have a, a a generous donor uh not me um although i am generous i'm not this generous, um, uh, who will write a check for an additional $5,000 should we achieve our $8,000 goal. So wow. so um, thank you to everyone um, uh, who can make a donation. We know it's tough at the moment, but uh, every every little helps in advancing the the, the advancement of you know the, this this telescope and this research so thank you um i'm gonna uh, look at some of the questions uh that are coming in and the first one is actually uh probably for alex um why uh why is this pyramid made of little sort of uh copper triangles uh why why is it this shape you know it, obviously a lot of design has gone into this this um uh, shape and this concept. Could you say a little bit more about the, the thinking behind it? And I'm going to bring up the image again while oh, yeah, you're talking. Thanks. Yeah, I, I think as everything which is radio frequency or high frequency is pretty much magic. So whatever you do, every everything kind of plays a role there. Um, so I'm not sure if you can show on the mouse. So the idea here, it's, it's kind of, it's called a log periodic feed. And so the idea here is you have to cover a wide range of frequencies. And the way you do it, you have to match kind of, um, if the wave travels in, you have to match the impedance of it with um, the structure. And the way you do it is you match it to the wavelength, or in that case, the quarter wavelength of the frequency, which means in our case, exactly, um, if you want to detect low frequencies, which have a a larger wavelength or longer wavelength, um, those frequencies are coupled in on the bottom where you have bigger spikes. So where the spikes are much bigger. So you can actually take a ruler and measure the length of that spike. And it tells you exactly to what frequency it is sensitive to. And then if you, so that's kind of maybe a gigahertz down here or so, or 1.2 gigahertz. And if you go up to where it gets really small, that is basically where you have the <laughs> five, five gigahertz, uh, sorry, 10 gigahertz or higher. So you could basically just measure the frequency response of it um, physically with a ruler by measuring the length of the spikes. And if you want to cover a wider frequency range, if you want to cover lower frequencies, you just make it bigger on the bottom. If you want to cover or measure higher frequencies, you just have to make it smaller on the top. And so the overall shape has to be matched to the optics of the antenna. So if I call optics, I mean the mirrors of the kind of the reflector of the antennas. So that's where the, op of, um, the overall shape comes from. Or okay. if you think of the pyramid pitch. Nice, okay. Thank you. Um, There's a question, um, uh, it's just, it's just a whale. This is a, a, an interesting approaching philosophy maybe rather than and physics. Um, are the frequencies we're searching for too anthropocentric? Um, you know, there, there must be a reason why these frequencies are chosen to search, you know, uh, uh, besides the fact that, that it, it, we're technologically capable of searching at these frequencies. What's the other reason that we're building, you know, this radio telescope to hit these frequency ranges? Yeah, um, and here that's a philosophical question, and I might answer with a philosophical answer. Um, we 
the less the less biased we are as humans in terms of what we are searching for the better at least in my opinion um we can you know we can be clever and think about what ways an extraterrestrial intelligence might communicate with us or might transmit um but that that just biases us um in 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 how we're searching and this is this is kind of a you know again philosophical but an if we can do everything then let's just do everything right we have we have a as alex mentioned we had a we have a feed that is sensitive all the way down to 1 gigahertz all the way up to 10 gigahertz so why should we really pick somewhere specifically to search let's just search the entire band and um let you know our biases not go into um not go into the search just just to add there maybe a very kind of uh, non-philosophical answer to that thing, um, to that question is um, basically that is the frequency range which is was at that time when they constructed a telescope the widest they could do. If you if you push it up higher in frequency, it gets more exp more difficult. Um, so it's this trade off of what can you um, build cost efficiently with the equipment you have, and that is basically what they could do is kind of going from about one gigahertz to um, about. 11.2 gigahertz is the overall frequency range, which we can observe with those um, antennas. And it's already much wider than kind of a lot of other instruments. Um, the difference in other instruments, they, look, they need multiple receivers. We do it with one receiver. So you would imagine kind of, if you wanna go higher up in frequency than 12 gigahertz, we could build a new receiver, put it on, go up to 20 gigahertz. But it's like um, a lot of yeah, cost and work to do that. So it's yeah. this trade-off of, what technology do we have? What is cost efficient to build? And how can we cover as much frequency range as possible? Right, yeah. You do what you can with the technology and with the money available, I suppose, <laughs> is basically. Um, we had a couple of questions coming in, um, well, about uh, the role of AI. Obviously, we've got a huge amount of data coming in. Um, do, how, is, how are things gonna develop over the next, next decade um, in terms of, of, of analyzing all of this data? Yeah, um, on, on a technical approach, um, what we use to process our data right now is a um, bunch of graphical processing units, which are really good in also doing AI. Um, so this is on the on the technical part, we are um, kind of ready to 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 start developing our own um, our, you know artificial intelligence um, algorithms to search to search for data. The the and so there's so many ways you can do it, right? Um, there. In, in AI, usually there are these two different paradigms. You can either do a, um, um, a, a supervised um, method to do it or an unsupervised method to do it. So in supervised techniques, you, you present the algorithm with what you think a, a signal might be, and you tell it, please search for something similar to that. In an unsupervised um, method, we try and ask the algorithm to just tell us if they find something abnormal in, in our data. And both, both those techniques are, um, can be directly applicable to, um, to, to SETI. The, the hard part comes um, from the fact that um, SETI is a really computationally expensive and a computationally harsh um, algorithm. And um, just throwing AI there means we're kind of overwhelming our computers. We, we might not be able to do every single search mm -hmm. um, or searching the data really effectively using AI. Um, and so what, what we try to do is we try to reduce or reduce this incredible amount of data into something where is, is um, achievable by, by an AI algorithm. And this is where AI can help us. Um, so yeah, so th th there, are, there are multiple venues um, where there are other groups out there that are actually trying to do this. Um, and there's so much, so much development going on. So um, yeah, so yeah, stay tuned to, to hear more about this. Yeah, okay, thank you. A um, couple of, um, throw these out to, together uh, for Alex. One is, um, uh, is there any plans to, to turn these into transmitters rather than receivers? <laughs> uh, let's put it that way. Um, and the other one is uh, just a, a quick one about, uh, Observing, can you can you observe twenty four seven? Is there a, an issue with that? Um, and what are the limitations? 
Okay. Um, I think, yeah, I start with the first one with kind of transmitting. So transmitting equipment or the kind of the architecture of a transmitter is completely different from a receiver. And if you build a very kind of an astronomical receiver, what we have, which is very sensitive, um, it's pretty much can be also um, very easily affected by any transmitter, so even satellites or something. So a very sensitive receiver and strong transmitters don't go very well together. Um, so the, the short answer is we, we're not planning on transmitting anything from the side here because that would interfere with our receivers. Um, there's certainly kind of um, an interesting approach of saying like we should transmit for um, SETI or is it METI messaging for <laughs> extraterrestrial intelligence, which we're already doing um, in a passive way. If you think of planetary radar and all of the kind of satellite communication which we have. So we're already sending, we're already radio loud for another civilization. If they, ser if they search for um, these types of signals with their equivalent ATA or ETA maybe, um, they would pick us up. Um, moving on from that with the observational. So we are pretty much at the moment, I would say um, we have a bit of a, the network bottleneck. We have some of the bottlenecks. So if you observe for five minutes, we have to process and shuffle data around for 10 minutes at the moment. So that's basically the observing run. We observe an object for five minutes, process the data for 10 minutes, go to the next object, five minute observation, 10 minute um, data analysis, moving them around, shuffling them around. Okay. Ideally, we want to get to a point where we can do in kind of semi real time, we observe one object, start processing the data and start observing the next one so we can continuously observe. But um, with the current system as it stands right now, we're pretty much, I would say, we're a three quarter of the day on sky with the antennas doing the observation and processing. And the other quarter, um, we use that throughout the day when we're here to work on improving the system and uh, speeding up the system then for the next iteration. So we're um, going in parallel, but the end goal is to be pretty much 24 seven on the sky with, um, with the antennas. Okay. Yeah, Great. and, and to, to add something really small here um, to, to the excellent points that Alex made, um, the, the the calibration process also is a is a human. Um, I would say it's it's not a human still needs to, a trained human still needs to look at the at the calibration of the instrument. So um, so you know we can technically run twenty four hours a day without having a human interfere, but then um, the the telescope you know there's certain you know the temperature changes outside and there's the sun and then sun sets and. There's so many elements that um, we don't we don't really think the system can be calibrated for a really long time. So a human needs to always come in and make sure everything's sort of calibrated. Look at some of the calibration solutions, making sure everything is fine. And so this kind of reduces our um, you know observing window from a 24 hour to something smaller than that. Okay. Um, thank you. We've got a, a few more. Uh, we've got people tuning in from Ireland, Cambridge in the UK, Cherry Hill, New Jersey. Uh, welcome everyone. We've got a few more stars donated. Uh, thank you to Robert and, and Sen, and there was somebody else down my list here. Ron, thank you very much. Um, I'm gonna tie this question in with a, a, another question from the audience. And uh, I think back to the human aspect of observing, you're saying, well, there's always gotta be human in there somewhere. And, and you guys are, are the humans. And I just wanna show, this is a, a, an image of, of where the um, Hat Creek Observatory is. Uh, and if you look very closely in this incredible uh, uh, natural landscape, there's a, there's a little cluster of, of telescopes down here. Um, you have chosen um, to, to work in, in this environment. And one of the questions is, what first got you interested in uh, SETI as, as, a, as a science? But also, you know, what, it, what is it like a, a day in the life of, of working in a place that's reasonably isolated? Um, you know, we'll, we'll keep, <laughs> um, and I will, I will leave that open uh, to you for you to answer or not to answer, um, especially <laughs> obviously as we come out of a pandemic when it was even more isolated. Um, Who wants to go first on that? <laughs> uh, I, 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 can, I can go first. Well, um, yeah. Um, I, I learned something um, being here is that for the next pandemic, 
Hat Creek is the perfect place for it. So <laughs> we were already isolated in here, everything, you know, the word was going crazy out there. We were just our own small bubble living in our own small observatory. Um, but um, I mean, that's, that's, you know, jokes aside, the being able to be on, on, on site and, you know, writing a piece of software and then, you know, hitting enter and compiling and looking outside, seeing what happens. Or, you know, if, if you <laughs> write something wrong and then one of the computers fails, you can go straight into the signal processing room and switch on a button. Um, all of that just accelerates how much, um, you know, accelerates the work that, 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 that one can do on, on site. So being on site is, is great in terms of, you know, career, in terms of um, um, the, the, the learning speed that, that, um, um, that, that one can, you know, the, the learning speed about the, the instrument that one is trying to, to work on. Um, but also the environment here is, is, is pretty nice. I mean, in, you know, you showed the picture, it's, it's an incredible place um, to be. It snows every now and then and it's kind of windy, <laughs> but we've got a snowstorm brewing outside for now. Um, but otherwise it's a, it's a really, it's a really nice, um, nice place. Um, now, in general, what got me interested in SETI, um, during my PhD, I was working on a fairly similar, similar algorithms and fairly similar um, observations, which is on um, something called a fast radio burst. And uh, we were trying to search for signals that are um, narrow in time rather than narrow in frequency. Um, we already knew that those signals are, you know, are, are, are astrophysical. And that were interesting. So, um, so I, I had kind of the kind of skills that can directly throw me into the SETI field and be able to um, to contribute. Um, but also in general, SETI is you know one of our most fundamental questions um, humankind can ever ask. Like, are we alone in this universe? Are we, um, you know, are we just this small sand grain just floating um, in some you know, random um, place in, in the Milky Way, or there are other civilizations out there. So yeah, so all of that kind of um, compiled, um, you know, with me ended up being here, I guess that's, um, okay. <laughs> that's the answer. Yeah. And Alex, is this is this an engineer's dream or an engineer's nightmare? Um, or does it depend? <laughs> does it depend, depend on the day? It depends. It depends on the day. Very yeah. clearly, it's a yeah. good day if I can fix more things than break down. Mm -hmm. It's a bad day if more things break down than yeah, I can. Okay. <laughs> and they're definitely kind of very. Yeah, both of them are happening very frequently. Okay. Um, yeah. So what, one of the things with um, you mentioned pandemic and kind of yeah, it's a very it's nice isolated. Um, but the other thing, which kind of after the so height of pandemic, and we were very thought like, okay, we're in the middle of nowhere, we can go out, hike, enjoy kind of outdoors. We had the fire, the Dixie fire, which was very close um, by, so we were pretty much trapped in, which was not good for our mental health, but it might be good for the refurbishment of the instrument. If you don't have anything else to do, then kind of work on the instrument. If you can't go outdoors, can't socialize. So um, it, it's an interesting place. Um, to talk about kind of how I got into SETI, I would say it started, um, so I guess when, when I was young, well, very interested in kind of SETI, um, I guess a lot of people know the SETI at home screen server, which came out of Berkeley. So that was the first kind of my first contact with SETI and I got all of the old computers together, which we had, um, what is it, a free, free 86 and Pentium ones and put an operating system on it and installed that um, screen server and basically just skyrocketed our electricity bill at home. <laughs> um, so that was the first thing. And then, um, yeah, later on, I would say more by coincidence, um, that position here happened um, to work on the instrument and it definitely is kind of a challenge. And I was interested on kind of, yeah, um, seeing if we can get it um, up and running and kind of operational. And mm -hmm. so since then I'm here and I think the, yeah, um, the SETI Institute has kind of locked us in and for the key away, so I guess no one of us <laughs> is getting out anymore. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yes, it's, it's a big secure lock, uh, with <laughs> 10 digits. Um, <laughs> It is, I mean, it, you know, as I say, I visited for the first time uh, last week. It is a beautiful and inspirational 
uh, place to be. And um, uh, it was wonderful to, to see you both in person and, and to, to, to get to know uh, the site. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Um, thank you, Alex and Whale, for joining us today. Uh, thank you for any donations that can make uh, their jobs easier and, and um, more exciting for us as well. Um, just a reminder that we have another event coming up. We have a, a SETI Talks on uh, April the 20th at 10 a.m. 10 a. Pacific. It's a morning because uh, our uh, speakers are uh, in Europe and we want to let them go to bed in a good time. The subject is Got Metal, Life and Metals, The Unexpected Connection. And of course, in astronomy, a metal is anything above helium in the periodic table. So, so that's worth watching. Um, tune in again. If you want to know more about the SETI Institute, please go to our website. Uh, if you want to watch this uh, uh, broadcast or any other uh, SETI Live, they are available on our YouTube channel. Um, I will say farewell. Thank you again to everyone for, for watching, and we'll see you again soon. Take care. Thanks. Bye. Hey, everyone. Bye-bye.